your state, your community, then you're in the right place. This is the Rutherford Magazine Show with host, State Representative Mike Sparks. He and guests are here to talk about local politics, history, faith, and freedom. Right, you listen to the Magazine Show. Your host, Mike Sparks. Well, I had a guest lined up and a great guy. He got a little busy. Josh Moss, I think you may call in with um, affordable heating and cooling. Josh and I have been talking about him coming up for for many months. And um, he's an entrepreneur with his Central Heat and Air Company and doing great. And um, got a lot of calls uh, he has with... Um, with his uh, company, with folks, I guess, getting a little warm, you know, with um, with this weather. Jackson, how you doing? I'm doing good. You know, I got um, I bought this phone from you yeah, last you year. This iPhone uh, SE. S. It's the third generation yeah. SE. And yeah. um, well, my Android. I'm so used to my Android. It 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 went out, just shut down on me Friday. So I went over at T-Mobile. Been with T-Mobile for many years and. Uh, over at Smyrna T-Mobile, Cuban lady helped me, and uh, another young African American, Gregory. Uh, I wish I remember the Cuban girl's name. Really sweet. Really helped me change it. But I'm not used to using this phone, man. It. Um, I had that when I jumped the, from Androids to iPhones. There was so you a got period an, you of got an jumping. iPhone. Yes, sir. Which one do you have? Uh, just an eleven. I, eleven. I, I, I'm a few generations behind. I'm. Uh, I'm. A college student, so I got to save money where I yeah. can. I can't be making the generation. Well, leaves. this this phone that belonged to your mother, your late mother, didn't it? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, your mom passed what two years ago? Yes, sir. Yeah, how two you taking ago, that? Uh, this month. How you been doing? You know, it, it, uh, it's got to be. You rough. just got to kind of move on. And you were twenty two when she passed. Yes, sir. Yeah, you know, I lost my mom a year and. Three, four months ago, and my mother was ready to go. She was 91, strong Christian believer. And, um, you know, as you've heard me say probably 10 times, I was playing Amazing Grace. You know, music therapy is an issue I've tried to take on and bring awareness to. And and um, and it, it worked. I mean, she calmed down. But I just got word that one of our a lady who, her and her husband, used to literally take me to church when I was a little boy, um, where Nissan is, used to be called Calvary Baptist Church over there. And uh, Linda... Uh, Linda Wilson passed away, and uh, folks may know their her, their daughters, um, Dana Wilson and um, Donna Wilson, and and uh, well, Donna's married. I, I can't think of her name currently, but um, uh, her Earl Wilson went to went to Parkway Baptist Church for many years with me, and a friend of mine was just telling me, boy, I tell you, I couldn't imagine. I mean, if I lost my mother at your age, I'd have been a basket case, man. Yeah, yeah, it's a, uh, you know. And where's your where's your father live? My father lives down by the coast. Oh, really? So he moved down there. So you, it, it's a, it's it's a complicated situation. Yeah, I've been trying to put you on the spot live no, no, on the radio. You know? They they just got divorced, and my dad yeah. just didn't want to be around her yeah. personally anymore. So he kind of really? killed it out of there. Yeah, well, speaking of divorce, I'm, I've been married 35 years today, man. Congratulations. 35 years. Congratulations. Man, I, my wife was 15. What's it like? She was 15. I was 19. We started dating. Wow. When dating, not married. Because one day I was on the house floor, I, I always try to recognize anniversary. And I forgot to say that we were married at uh, 18. And I was 22. And uh, everybody thought I married him. She was 15. They were looking at me. I seen him kind of whispering over there. And they had to make a clarification but um anyways yeah that anniversary is obviously a big a big deal in my life you know my late father was married well some accounts were four times another account was five times and um you know it uh Jeez. you know it's yeah he was he was world war ii he was a very difficult guy like on this phone how do i get back to like here i'm already lost sorry i'm sitting here looking at some notes here what's going on how do i how do i find just just like I'm on this home screen, mm-hmm. and how do you how do you, how do you go back to like a previous app? Yeah, I had an app I was looking at for notes, and I don't see where it's at. Okay, so 
See, the Android is a whole lot. There, there's, that's what I wanted right there. Yeah, I wanted just that, that one note right there. That's what I wanted. You know, um, I mean, I guess the big thing in the in the news is, um, you know, the Israel Iran conflict, and um, you know, I don't know if folks study prophecy, and I'm not a prophecy expert, but um, you know, I think it's inevitable with with what's going on in Israel that Iran is, um, you know, doing what they're doing, and next, I'll, I'll say Russia is going to will end up being involved, whether it's a proxy war or whatnot, but. Um, you know, little bitty tiny. Have you ever studied prophecy? You ever studied how Israel even became a nation? Uh, I've never studied it, it, studied it directly, but it I am miracle. familiar. I mean, it literally is a miracle. They have all these haters around them. They're all surrounded by they're surrounded by enemies. And if you go back and study what was it called, the Six Day War, and how Israel defended themselves against all those countries that came against them, I mean, it really is miraculous how. They've been able to stand the test of time. Um, but if folks have ever studied um, Jonathan Kahn, he, he has talked about um, some of the conflicts that we're seeing and how this is really prophecy uh, playing out. And, um, you know, I was at an M MTSU class a few months ago, and um, someone brought up Israel, and uh, they kind of said it in a little bit of a negative light. And... My professor looked over at me. I remember we're live in the class, and he said, Sparks, what's your thoughts? I said, well, you know, the Jewish people have been the most persecuted people on the face of the earth. Six million Jews were annihilated during World War II, and, uh, you know, they've suffered a lot of persecution. over For them to be a nation is a miracle in itself, which is part of prophecy. And um, But even the people returning back to Israel is miraculous, which is prophesied. So uh, Jonathan Kahn, uh, if folks want to find him on YouTube, talks about this. And, um, you know, what he called, I think the book's called The Harbinger, um, where he talked about uh, the parallels between ancient Israel's disobedience to God and modern-day America's departure from our Judeo-Christian foundation. I mean, I see it. Um, I see it in Nashville. I see it in the state. I see it in the country. And things that we would have, thought were right when I was your age is not kind of getting twisted like it's wrong and um, you know we're seeing more I mean uh, violence whether it's you know someone being carjacked or shot you know you've heard me say Jackson and we had two two young teenagers at Meg's high school that were killed I mean at school and I don't see any protesters over those two African-American kids that's going to cost the taxpayers half million to a million dollars to incarcerate the, the, the two kids that killed them. All those people in Nashville protesting, they're not pro protesting over them, you know? They're not talking about the mental health epidemic. They're not talking about the manifesto. They're not talking about the transgender um, shooter that, that killed those kids at Covenant. And that just amazes me that no one's talking about this. It just, I don't know, maybe I'm the one that's odd, maybe everybody else is right. It's just things I see in this nation today are really um, just really disheartening. You know, our prison budget's doubled since I was elected. And you've heard me say, Jackson, I've never had a lobbyist come into the office and talk about the epidemic of fatherless, the problems that we're seeing in our culture. Um, and your generation, not to be disrespectful, I don't think your generation's ready. What do you think? Ready for the world? Do you think y'all are ready? Um, I personally think so. I just think we're not happy about it. Yeah. What about do you think? Thing. What do you think's cause of? I mean, not happy. You know, the depression and mental health crisis that we're in. What do you think has spurred some of that with your generation? Uh, economic opportunities. Uh, it's really far. It's can be really, really hard to find a decent paying job that can get people by and have them live comfortably comfortably yeah i have to work two jobs just yeah. to meet rent on my apartment yeah and i live with three other people wow how so, many how many two bedroom three bedroom that's a three bedroom yeah so i and when i have to work two jobs to make ends meet yeah and when the people all the people i know have to either need 
financial support from their parents or need to work extra jobs, yes. it it creates a very tense environment where, in general, people are not enthusiastic or optimistic about their yeah. futures. I, I, I can see your point. You know, um, there is a you know, look at the cost of housing, cost of rent, and um, really is challenging um, with your with your generation. I mean, the average home today, what is three five hundred. About four hundred, I think, in this 400. area. Four twenty. Yeah, four hundred easily gets up to five hundred. You know, and I bought my I'm, first house at twenty-two, and it was sixty thousand dollars. And wife was nineteen, and um, and back then you could work one job and you'd be able to pay. Well, for that she house. she worked too. I mean, it was a struggle. Our payment was five fifty, and um, it was it was no doubt a struggle to. And then had a, you know our first child at, and she was. 18 and um but times there are like bob dylan said times there are a change and uh the challenges are i'd argue greater today than they were in our generation but i've got men of valor uh genevieve turner is that is that genevieve and i'm uh calling in genevieve how you doing i'm great how are you representative doing good are you um are you on i-40 right now where are you at cookville I am the road warrior of all road warriors. I'm about 15 miles, 20 miles from our campus in Nashville, our Men of Valor campus. So yes. Here in Nashville. Oh, okay. Well, y'all are going to be coming up tomorrow, and and Josh Josh Moss that was going to come up with us, um, we were going to talk about his own battles, and he may call in um, shortly. But um, uh, folks that don't that aren't aware of Men of Valor, Genevieve, give us an explanation of what Men of Valor does and and y'all's um y'all's mission statement yeah for sure um we are reconciling men to god their families and their communities is really the gist of what we do and by that what i mean i, I say that we have four big prongs so we work with men while they're incarcerated we're in almost every prison in the state of tennessee yeah and we're in about i think we're, we're right now we're in five county jails and have three underway so about to be in eight county jails as well and that's really where we start our program with folks. Um, that is discipleship groups, which we call our D groups. We're doing reentry type classes. We're doing intensive Bible studies, and really just the work system being there. It's a crazy environment for those who've never had the privilege of going inside of a prison. Yes. Um, so having people that you can trust in a place where you don't have to watch your back for an hour is is a nice reprieve. Yes. Um, and, and in the place for healing and growth. So that's prong one. And then if you are in our programming while you're incarcerated, you can apply to come to one of our two aftercare facilities. And so, we, I mean, this is an academy. It's a year-long program once you're released from prison or jail. It's freshman, sophomore, junior, senior quarters. Um, and it is intense. We tell guys while they're applying, while they're still locked up, it's going to be the hardest year of your life. Are you ready for it? So um, we have 93 beds in Antioch out, out in Nashville here and yes. 30 beds in Knoxville. So those are our, our newest campus. Um, and that's, that's the second wrong. I'd say the third thing that Men of Valor does is we work with the family, the families of our men. So, I mean, imagine being a caretaker with a guy you've had a child with who's locked up, and you're having to learn how to parent with him from prison, how to make money, how to yeah. his, all the uh, everything he brought to the table is gone. Um, and so what does that look like? Do you have room to allow this person to heal? We look different when we change. So how can we be a support system for these women for these kids, um, number one indicator, very top tier indicator of going to prison is having an incarcerated parent. So we want to yeah. break some cycles there. That cycle, yes. And I'd say the fourth thing we do is my little tears. So I'm the director of policy and government affairs. And when you've worked in the system for a lot, I worked in the system for about 16 years in different places, um, DA's office, sheriff's office. So from all ends of it, you can help, but no, it's broken. I think even if you work in the system uh, or don't work in the system, I'm sorry. So how do we, how do I help people who are making policies, who are making laws, understand the trickle-down effect of the laws and policies that they're making? How does that really impact people that they're wanting to impact? Is it working? How can we do things better? You know, those kinds of things. So that's, in a nutshell, what we do. Yes. Well, you know, how did you get involved uh, uh, with Men of Valor? I know, if, yeah, a lot of people ask that. I like to say I'm their woman of valor because there really are very few of us on staff. Um, but 
So I started, like I said, about 16 years ago. My, my first job out of college was in felony session court as a victim witness coordinator. So I grew up in, you know, the nice part of town. I was a debutante. So I didn't know going in at 22 to felony session court um, was a big eye. I mean, that, that changed my entire paradigm. I had to under learn that people didn't grow up like I did. And yeah. I knew that people had trauma or parents were divorced, but I didn't understand the extent of what so many of my neighbors went through. I mean, I, I it, it's sad. So when I went to college, when I left Knoxville for a while, I didn't even know we had government housing. So I was very far removed. So that opened my eyes to what cycles can do of trauma, what um, you know, terrible things that happen to people in their lives. How can that impact and affect us in ways that we don't even know? So I continued working in it, and um, for 16 years, I've really been studying the system. I went to this jail. It was in Ireland, and they had changed it into this museum to learn about rehabilitative practices and incarceration. And this, again, this was probably, I don't know, I was 18, so what, 20 years ago? Um, and it just blew my mind. I'd never seen anything like it or thought about prison in that way of actually trying to do more than just uh, incapacitate someone, but how do we stop more crime? I mean, working with victims of crime is harrowing. If you, you see how sad and hurtful and awful crime is, so how do we actually prevent it yes. um, and rehabilitate people when they're locked up? So that's, that's been my mission, and Men of Valor was kind enough to take a chance on picking me up. Yes. Well, you know, um, you know, it, it's on on this show I've talked about you know, there's there's a lot of lobbying in Nashville, lobbying legislature, and and uh, I've never, other than y'all, uh, I've never had anybody come come to the office and say, "Man, we've got to turn this around. Man, we've got to get more positive male role models involved in the youth." And you know, it frustrates me because I do see a, I do see a little element of folks that will want to like str- like strengthen laws, like okay, we're going to take this misdemeanor and turn it into a felony and i'm thinking you know that that's in my opinion that doesn't move the needle to prevent crime and um unless i'm wrong somebody's welcome to, to correct me but um you know a lot of folks don't realize we incarcerate more people in this nation than any country on the face of the earth and i'm looking at some data here yeah. which is a, it's a 500 percent increase the last 40 years 500 percent increase i know it's doubled yeah. since i was elected in 2010 it went from 600 million to 1.2 billion dollars is what we're paying as taxpayers and some people need to be locked up there's no doubt they need to be locked up but it seems like if we could spend more effort to try to reach people before they make dumb decisions and land them you know end up being incarcerated and so much of it as you know has to do with with addiction and um and the yeah. mental health problems that we see today. Yeah, I mean, here's a stat, Mike. So the U.S. has 5% of the entire world's population, right? Yes. 5% we make it up. However, we incarcerate about 25% of the incarcerated people in the whole world. Wow. America has 25%. Man, that's crazy. Population. And so if it was working just to lock people up, we would be the safest country in the world, and we know that's not true. So, that I mean, I think you're right on when we look at what are we passing to make this a misdemeanor into an e-felon. Like, what, what does all that really do if we're still not being preventative? Are we actually caring about stopping this problem and working on public safety? Or, why, you know, what's the rhetoric? Why are we using the rhetoric? Yes. Well, I know the uh, a friend of mine ran the Rutherford County Jail, Bernard Salandi, great guy. Do you know Bernard, by the way? Do you know him? I do not. Great, great guy. And um, uh, I remember him telling me years ago when I was on the county commission, he he was put over the jail ministry by then Sheriff Truman Jones. And uh, he had shared this with me. He had a daughter that, that was killed in a car wreck years ago at Tuskegee University. And and uh, he had to come come down to Denton trying to you know find where her body was. Really sad. But he was wow. said he was kind of really sad dealing with, you know, with loss of his daughter and all. And. He said a few weeks later, the sheriff asked him to, to head up the jail ministry at, at what we call 940 uh, Rutherford County over here. And um, he thought, you know, I'm not out here talking about scripture. I'm not here holding the Bible all the time or nothing. And he thought, you know, there's about 
900 people roughly, 850 guys up there. And then he kind of thought, you know what, you know, maybe I can help these guys. And, uh, but I used to ask him, I said, man, what is the silver bullet? Cause you know, there's, you know, there's just so much that we can do to try to improve people's lives. And he, he said it was the gospel, man. He says, I'm telling you, so I've seen people's lives change. I've seen people act better. And, um, you know, I've often said that that program costs the taxpayers nothing. You know, I know one guy with, with Teen Challenge, I don't know if you know Gene Garcia. He was on the air with me a couple of years ago, and he was on heroin, strung out, living. I mean, I think he was, like, living literally out in the woods. I don't even know what city he was in. But he um, he shared with me he's seen a truck or something, like a box truck, and it said Hope on it, H-O-P-E. And he said, man, that's what I need. I need some hope. And he said he just prayed and for for a healing. And he says, man, just something come over me. He says, and he had no urge to use heroin again. I know it sounds odd, but I'm thinking, man, if that program works and costs the taxpayers nothing, why don't we promote it and share it? I mean, even an atheist, I would think, would agree with that. Yeah. There's a program. So Florida, for instance, their Department of Correction does something called Faith and Character. So it's either a Faith and Character pod, or they've moved to some entire prison that are Faith and Character institutions. Or whole, that's what they're all about. Yeah. So you can, I mean, obvi- yes, I believe, and that's how my life was changed, was through Jesus. But this is open to agnostic, to atheist, to whoever. And so it's all about um, your insides. It's all about emotional intelligence. Yes. Asking yourself the big question. You know, it's very incentivized to be there. They don't have in florida you're not paid as an inmate whenever you do your job and so there's a lot of different kind of incentives so these prisons have like a two inch thicker mattress which you wouldn't believe how much that matters for yeah. people locked up but the point of this is that they were like oh we're piloting these we had some pods are they working they had this big hurricane where they had to clear out some of the prisons so that they could get the inmates somewhere safer they're getting hit by a hurricane and at these faith and character pods, they found zero contraband, none, zero. And so immediately they were like, well, this is working. Let's do-. So they doubled the program and then started building entire institutions of it. So, yeah, I think character, faith, um, hope, all of the things that Jesus really hits on, whether you believe in whatever religion, it, the, the character of Jesus, it saves us. It makes us think selflessly. It makes us think be meek, kind, all the things that he talks about in his very first sermon, the Beatitudes, that's, that's what truly does change people. Well, that, you know, I think just some human dignity, you know? Y- yes, you know, you had, um, at y'all's event, was that last Tuesday, the y'all's big event at, um, at Music City yes. Center? Yes, we had 1,700 people come out to our, our biggest fundraiser is our breakfast, so yeah. Yeah, it was uh, well attended. The governor was there. Appreciate, and I, I was glad to see Mayor Glenn Jacobs, the Knoxville County Mayor, there. Oh, he's been amazing. Like he came. I don't think he'd mind if I told this story. But when we were starting to open up in Knoxville, he sent he came and his staff under the radar by themselves, no news team, wasn't on their Facebook, nothing, yeah. and came and put together furniture for us. Wow. Like, I mean, he is. He was on my radio show a couple weeks ago. He is very committed to, as he should, as someone who's leans conservative, to what what do we do about this epidemic when it comes to mass incarceration and mass supervision? What are we doing fiscally with our dollars? Yes. <laughs> you know, if you want to think about it, nothing nothing about the Jesus standpoint. Amen. Yep. Fiscal, <laughs> I agree. a lot to look at, you know? Yeah. That's what I was telling. Was it you I was talking to or I was talking to somebody I said, well, the the way which I, from what I know about Mayor Glenn Jacobs, and I don't, I mean, he come in and and visit and came to our chili cook off a year and a half ago. Uh, we raised funds for Brenda Bryant's church um, and her mission. It's a they've got a big food pantry. I think we raised about twenty five hundred dollars. But he came in and uh, great guy. Took the time out. We had a I remember one one guy young man was special needs and he was a big wrestling fan you know and he took the time out and for him and um uh but he leans kind of like civil libertarian which i feel like i do the same thing and you know you don't want yeah. a bunch of excessive government and laws and bureaucracy uh to stifle whether it's a marketplace or your own personal freedoms but um you know a lot of, a lot of folks are saying he's going to run for governor have you heard much about that oh you know i 
I can't say anything, but I don't know. I mean, <laughs> that's I, what, I'm the same rumor, that's what I've heard. Uh, anyway, don't mean to put. I would be very happy. I would be very happy because I think that from what I can tell and seeing him, you know, what he's done for Knoxville, which is where I live. Yeah. Um, what he's done for our, our county planning. We've had, you know, huge uptick and lack of housing, all kinds of things. We're like yes. a little bit behind Nashville. Everything that y'all go through, we go through a little bit later. Um, but he's done huge for that. Um, we've had terrible homelessness uprising he's really working on that he's got character you know he thinks through things and so i was i was impressed when i got to have a more uh, in-depth conversation with him but that's all i know yeah and the folks don't know who mayor clinton no fun. i don't have the dirt what's that yeah. say again say again I said, i'm no fun i don't have the dirt i'm no fun the uh well he seems like he's the the real deal and um uh if folks don't know who we're who we're talking about um he was the, I'm going to give you some of his bio. Kane, the wrestler, Glenn Thomas Jacobs, born in April 26, 1967, um, and uh, American politician, and he, I guess he was signed to WWE in 1995, was inducted into the 2021 class of WWE Hall of Fame, 2018, was elected the Republican mayor of Knox County, and 2022 won his second term as mayor. Um and I was talking about him. I don't follow wrestling, you know, but um, I think there was, I guess the little narrative that he's, um, is it brother-in-law to, um, to one of the other wrestlers? Yeah, we, yes, the do, Undertaker. The Undertaker. And, and I mean, I <laughs> I thought it was like for real. And um, somebody's like, no, no, that's not, that's not really his, is it nephew or cousin or something? Yeah, it's not, they're not even related. Okay. Yeah, so. <laughs> Somebody Those was. The parts they played. Yeah. Someone was correcting me, like, "No, man, that's not. It's not really his brother-in-law or no, nephew." Yeah. You know. Um, I love it because that backstory. That's what we were talking about. Is there's this this thing called aces, so adverse childhood. Oh yes, that's real. The more, yeah, the more you have of those, the more likely you are to be incarcerated for yes. addiction, all the things. So we were. I was kind of poking at him, but you know, his backstory as Kane was that his brother burned his face. And that's why you had to wear the mask. And he, that was his villain origin story. Oh. Like, so you get aces. Like, you understand. Yes. And what, what kind of goes on there? Like, you're a living proof of it. And you taught it to the nation through WWE. Thanks, sir. Well, he seems like he's got a heart. And usually guys that have went through tough times, they usually lean towards, you know, want to help the less fortunate and, and so forth. But, you know, I don't know. I just see such a disconnect today um but you know the the scripture uh where jesus says i was hungry you fed me i was thirsty you gave me something to drink i was homeless you gave me a room i was shivering you gave me clothes i was sick you stopped to visit i was in prison and you came to visit me um but i'll be honest i i think a lot and i don't mean to put down the general assembly but man i just think there's such a disconnect between the reality of what's happening in our culture and politics. I, mean, I know you, you may not want to say anything, but um, you know, we do have some good members, but I challenged them on the floor, I guess about a week or two. You know, I visited that um juvenile detention facility. You know, we're trying to implement the game of chess and just get these young people to think before they move, you know. And we've got a budget request. Hopefully it gets um hopefully we get this funding. We're asking for a hundred thousand to to help implement this and uh correction centers and and you know, high at risk youth. And like I've I've asked people, I said, if you got a better idea to challenge these young people to think critically before they pull that trigger, before they take that pill, before they carjack or steal a car, or steal a gun, um, you know, let me know what it is, uh, because you know we got to get back to the scriptures and what Jesus talked about. Even an atheist, you know, should would agree if this program like that y'all do transforms lives just like celebrate recovery if i don't know if you're familiar with celebrate recovery but but yeah, i've heard use, yeah that's our drug and alcohol that we use so many positive i've i visited a couple of times my buddy floyd floyd barrett and um uh and you know there's a great return on investment because like i challenged the tdoc commissioner in finance and our lawmakers is that prisons are expensive to build I mean, you, you can't incarcerate your way out of And, you know, what I say, legislate and incarcerate your way out of problems. Prisons are, ex especially 
juvenile prisons are extremely expensive to um, to yeah. to build. So your program, I know, uh, returns big dividends to the taxpayers. So we hope so. I mean, we for we average out our recidivism rates, and so that is recidivism as it's measured in Tennessee's Department of Correction. Those other states might be different, but it's measuring if there are um, any other instance of going back to prison or jail within three years of release. Um, and so, you know, we've been keeping that since 2011, and our average for program graduates is under 15%. Wow. And I think what's interesting about what you were just saying with juveniles is um, the, the story just always gets me and it helps me understand perspective. There's one of our one of our reentry ministers. He works on the campus in Knoxville. His name's Rick. He was driving. He was he used to work at a juvenile detention facility, and he was driving one of the kids uh, somewhere. I can't remember where he had to transport him. And the kid had carjacked somebody. He would stolen a car. And Rick said to him, you know, they were talking, becoming kind of friends. He's like, you knew that was wrong. You knew right from wrong. Why yeah. did you do that? And the kid looked at Rick and said, my dad taught me how to hotwire it. Wow. And I just, you know, what yeah. we think is right and wrong is so, we are so fortunate I know. to have what we believe is right and wrong as our right and wrong. Um, yes. So having to relearn what it is to have character and what it is to be successful and what it, you know, all of that. It's just, it's, it's hard and beautiful to watch, I'd say. Well, how much is it? I, I read some of your stats uh, at the event. Is it 35000 a year to incarcerate an adult today? It's around in there. The last I saw from TDOC, it was $111.50 per day for just a regular inmate on average um, to be housed. And so, you know, you got to think about they're not paying taxes, yes. special services their kids are on more than likely, um, the attorney's fees, uh, everything else that's piling up, all of the dividends that we're taking from society in different departments and different places. So that is literally just the average of housing them. You know, I've got some stats pulled up here, and I see where Alabama is building the most expensive prison in U.S. history. It's $1.08 billion for a 4,000-bed facility. And, I mean, a billion dollars, that's a $1,000 million that we can't use for infrastructure or education or mental health a billion dollars on a 4,000 bed uh, facility. But, you know, we're obviously America's not doing it right. And I tell you, I think one of the reasons is because there's nobody advocating, nobody other than y'all. I don't really see many folks that are trying to, I mean, I doubt seriously if any pastors are talking about this, they probably don't even know this stuff. You know what? It's tough. It's tough because it's one of those, you know, it's not an easy one to win. It, it's, I came from a place of working with victims, and I've had, you know, people very close to me with terrible stories that have happened to them. And so sometimes I, I feel like when I try to talk about what might actually work in stopping and preventing crime, yep. it sounds like I'm being, I, I'm not, I'm callous towards victims of crime. That I'm just trying to, I've, I've been told that I like to hug a thug. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so... You know, I have to weigh that with how it feels for people. But I also know, working with victims, that there was never healing for them. When yeah. you are charged with a crime, your attorney tells you straight up, deny everything, plead not guilty, don't take accountability, you continue on that way. The victim is told, hey, you're a witness for the state. This is actually the state of Tennessee versus Genevieve Turner. Yeah. You're, you're a witness for us. You have to come. They, you know, you're, what you want to see happen and I'm sure there are some good DAs, don't get me wrong, but what typically what you want to see happen really isn't it. You don't get to be a part of the process and then get to show up to parole for the for however long. Um, and so there's never a chance on either side for healing is my two cents on it. Yes. You know, I, was, I may have shared with you, you know, I got to visit um, about six women that were in prison about last month, I believe it was, and all of them were on death row. Yeah. Um, one was charged at, she was 14 years old, and her mother had just passed a few months earlier, I think. I think it was a drug overdose. And um, and somehow she shot and killed her her aunt or something. And, you, you know, you go talk about childhood trauma. And, you know, just like this young man here at the station, he lost his mom a couple of years ago. Just 
what he's just like 22, 23 years old. And um, uh, but the Aces childhood trauma is real. There's no doubt. Now, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I would have, I would have discounted all that and thought, no, nah, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and move on. You know, my dad was yeah. World War II, and he always told me, son, if you ever get in trouble, don't call me. I'm not coming after you. And um, looking back, I was glad. I mean, really, I had a you know I had a father there, and I think that's what made the difference. And then a Christian stepfather. Um, but yeah. I I tell you, Genevieve, I think so much of it is lack of like you mentioned that 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 boy was taught how to how to hot wire uh, you know a car when by his own dad. I mean, my dad taught me how to work on cars and put the money up for my first right. car, which I turned around and sold, made a made a thousand dollars on it in sixteen and used the other car that I had sold it for the down payment on our business now, which was our first house at 22. But it was all down to that father that, that helped me, you know? Um, but how much of the, when you look at the, the inmates and guys that have leaving those have been incarcerated, how much of that do you think is ACEs? Do you think a vast majority is 80, 90% those, those guys fit that, fit that description? For sure. I mean, at least there's, you know, I, I can't speak for the entire prison population, but I can talk about my guys. Um, and, you know, we have about 2,500 that we serve um, who are locked up, and we've got probably 250 will come through our campus this year. Um, but, you know, you talked about, yeah, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and sometimes we forget that some people don't even have boots. Yes. Um, and so I, we do a little, one of our staff members is a PhD level academic he's wonderful he goes into the prisons and teaches on trauma and aces and on neuroplasticity that you're not stuck you haven't fried your brain like that old commercial you know this is your brain this is yeah. your brain on drugs and yeah. kill it that doesn't have to be your life like you can create new neural pathways and change yeah but part of that is we do a little survey as to aces um in one of our counseling classes and i mean I'd, i've never seen anyone with under six aces I, yeah. most people end up 10 out of 10 and these are the some of the worst things that can happen to you, you know, yeah. physical, sexual, verbal abuse, um, divorce of your parents, you know, a family member in end of incarceration. So these are tough things that have happened while your brain is still developing. What do you think most the of members of my party, Republican Party, do you think they, they get this, they understand, or do you think there is uh, folks that don't care or folks that just like, hey, it's not my problem, I'm just moving on, you know? Uh, do, do you think the pen, the pendulum, the, the needle is, is moving towards trying to help really the least of these? Do you see that? Do you feel that in the Tennessee General Assembly? That's a good question. Um, and I know I'm putting you on the spot. I'm, I'm, no, I, uh, you know, Governor Lee came in so strong in his first term with second chances, with criminal justice reform. He's been a huge advocate for us. He was um, a mentor for a man about yes. 20 years ago. That's how long he's been working yes. in a valor. So he, he gets it. He understands the entirety of the system, like zooming out and looking at all of it as opposed to just an individual and their choices. Um, so I think when he can, there was an awesome tide, it felt like, of, okay, how do we think about crime? How do we think about prevention? Mm -hmm. And I have felt a little bit of a pullback lately. I, I think there's a lot of fear and a lot of um, terrible, terrible crime that has happened in some cities in Tennessee lately. I mean, yep. terrible crime, murder, that kind of thing. Um, and sometimes we are prone to knee-jerk reactions and, and making laws on one thing that happened. I'm not saying that that person did not matter. I'm not saying their life, you know, is not worthy of an act or a law. I just, um, when you are making laws for the entire state, you have to think about how they're going to impact everything. And so, I've, you know, I've only been doing this two years. I'm not, I'm a registered lobbyist, but I'm not really good at it. I don't think. But I, the conversations I've had last session was really just getting to know people. And this session, I feel like people are asking more questions and wanting to know some of the research and like, huh, well, why do you feel that way as opposed to just, okay. So I, I do think there's some, some momentum again in at least wanting to understand at least like, had an awesome conversation with somebody that went with you to go see those women and you know he was really challenging me about what does what i don't care if they're serving 50 years doesn't that be what the victim 
is not right yeah. for them. And yeah. So we were just kind of talking through the nuance of it all, and that yeah. gives me a lot of hope. When people want to talk about nuance, I get a lot of hope. Yeah, and and you're, I mean, I, I don't think you're talking about Ed Butler. I don't think uh, Ed would mind me mentioning his name. Um, but uh, then then it was Elaine Davis went, and Elaine got choked up. She she broke down, and started crying. But I asked every one of those yeah, women. I said. Yeah, no, she's she's real sweet, and um, uh, but I'd asked all six women, you know, where do you find hope at? H O P E, hope, because everybody's got to have hope, you know, and um, and they said, well, hope with their friends, hope with their family. Remember, they they're serving what a fifty one year sentence, and I'm kind of putting my yeah. mind in their shoes, like how would I deal with it? You know, they all I think got their degrees except for one, but I asked about sexual abuse. And I said, how many of y'all were sexually abused, you know, growing up? And three hands immediately went up. One hand went up slow. So not that I know much yeah. about psychology, but I'm assuming that was a close relative or something. And, um, uh, but that's when you, you know, that's an issue that, you know, I took on as a lawmaker that ended the, the uh, statute of limitation, go back and prosecute. And that really started up here at this station with uh, Scott uh, Walker asking about that. But once I started studying that issue, Man, it is like an epidemic of a crime that seems to go unreported where roughly, what, 70, 80 percent of females have been abused and um, one in six, um, uh, one in six boys, one in four women, one in six boys, and 70 percent of the crime goes unreported. And it's like a silent epidemic that messes with people's heads. Uh, And I'm sure a lot of men probably don't come out. Do they ever, do y'all have therapy for things like that with with men of valor for men to we talk do. about those and issues? I'm glad you brought all of that up because that's, you know, that's my background. I worked with domestic violence victims and um, child victims, so sex crimes and physical abuse. And so, yeah, I mean, the amount that was underreported, the amount that was, you know, this was before Me Too and all that when I worked there. And yeah. so it was a lot of well, what were, you know, the women, what were you wearing? What did you do to bring it on? So that, yeah. that was kind of yeah. the mentality back then. And then I was in the DA's office when it was, you know, domestic violence was a family problem. Like, we don't bring that into the courts. We don't talk about that. That's, that's between a husband and a wife. So that's, we've come way further in, in how we think about those things since then. But, yes, we actually just got, we do have a, four counselors on staff, and we just got money, the opioid abatement grant. Yes. So um, Tennessee got a large portion of money, and we applied for it and just found out that we got it. And that is all going for counseling. So we are going to be able to move our ratio from 40 to 1 participants to counselors yep. to 25 to 1. Wow. And we're going to be able to be sending therapists inside the prison. So Are you going to... Actual LCSWs in the prison. Let me ask you... Um not to play devil's advocate, but are, are you going to be able to find those therapists? I mean, are they? Are there, is there enough therapists out there? I hope. We, I wrote... The grant was written to where we can pay them $77,000 per year plus a pretty big package and i think wow i've understood from my social worker friends that's really good money for lcsws um and so i'm hoping that we can get someone uh well, we get more than someone we get four hires probably that you know they've they've specifically been trained in substance abuse disorder and opioid use disorder and can really speak into the addiction um, yes. so i'm hoping if you know anybody anyone listening wants to work for men of valor and is a licensed counselor and loves jesus please Please call in. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, the um, I had something kind of cool happen at y'all's event. I was walking up, and I seen Rudy Kalis and um, talked to talk to Rudy. In fact, I wanted to get Rudy on the radio, but I had I told him I tried to call him, couldn't reach him, and I had I had the radio station's number phone, and I was like, hey, I knew he looked familiar. Well, he was he I knew him from years ago. He was friends with my youngest son, and I said, man, I said I was literally I was doing a ride along with the sheriff's department. With, with Deputy Chris Beach, and uh, who's, who's a friend of mine, and, and they were looking for this guy. He was literally running from the law on his motorcycle. And I remember hearing the guy's name, wow. and I thought, man, I knew he was just jacked up on some drugs. And, and I mean, he looked, you know, just a handsome young guy, I guess about 32. And the irony, I just went to help his mother, his, his grandmother. In fact, I tore up my car that, that was working on the road, and if you see my bumper all damaged on the bottom, it's from that street and um she mailed me a nice pocket watch of the day it was kind of surreal um nice little engraved pocket watch as a little thank you but um but i said man what's turned what 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 turned your life around 
And you know what his answer was? There was one word. You know what his answer was? God. Nope. You're close. What was it? Jesus. It was Jesus. Jesus. And, and man, he, he looked... I, yeah, and then Hustle Recovery walked up, Troy Sandifer and Kim. Do you know uh, Kim? Oh, what's her last name? Um, they were on the show with me here a while back. You know, I run a license plate for them, so they're going to try to run a license plate called End Overdose, uh, and it's going to be a Herculean task. they got to sell a 1,000 of them. I want it to be called Her- Hustle. They didn't. They decided not to do that, um, but it's called End Overdose. But it was really cool. They got part of that grant, and – a uh, shout out to Com- County Commissioner Craig Harris that, that's been very involved with that opio- opioid abatement task force. Um, Genevieve, can you hold if we take a quick break, or do you need to go to your meeting? Sure. Okay, hold. We'll, we'll be. No, I'm, take- I'm good. I'm just okay, we'll be just a few minutes with a quick break. Thank you. Most people know that their insurance can provide them with coverage for the many life's mishaps. But I can help you also unlock discounts, save money, and get benefits with Farmers Insurance Policy Perks. Whether we're discussing home or auto insurance, I am here to help you understand these great perks. Call me, Mark Lewis, at 615-625-7070 for a quote, and you can get a whole lot of something with Farmers Policy Perks. We are farmers. Bum, 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 bum. Not available in every state. Only available select Farmers branded policies underwritten by Farmers Truck or Fire Insurance Exchanges or affiliates. Dr. Automotive Auto Repair and Maintenance Mechanic Shop Garage provides car owners in Smyrna, Murfreesboro, Laverne, and the Middle Tennessee area with excellent auto repair services. Deep rooted experience in serving both foreign and domestic automobiles allows for proper diagnosis in a timely manner. Check them out online at autorepairsmyrna.com, call them at 615 220 0971, or stop on in at 1205 Hazelwood Drive in Smyrna. Hey, Middle Tennessee, it's Mark from the Safe House, and now the security riddle of the day. What's less secure than a fake safe from a big box or furniture store? Joe Biden's fake border policy, of course. But hey, there is good news. This time next year, Joe Biden will not be president. So drop by the Safe House and check out the largest selection of safes in the Southeast. Build a wall around your valuables with a safe from the Safe House. We have certified delivery crews to deliver and install your safe. Don't let a crackhead or illegal deliver your safe. With over 30 years in the safe business, the Safe House is the place to buy a safe in Tennessee. So go to NashvilleSafeHouse.com. AFFI is Middle Tennessee's premier choice for pest, wildlife, and moisture control. They specialize in those difficult and unique cases. You can reach them by phone at 615-300-2395. That's 615-300-2395. Or stop in at 200 Glen Rose Lane in Smyrna. Josh Moss with Affordable Heating and Cooling provides residential HVAC and duct cleaning services to the Middle Tennessee area. With more than 20 years of experience, Josh Moss and the AHC team provide 24-7 service and take care to ensure whatever work you need done is done in a professional, timely manner. Contact AHC at 615-745-1676. That's 615-745-1676. Or go to their website at affordableheatingandcoolingtn.com. My wife and I enjoy going by Yard Sale, Inc. We usually go to both locations, the one in Smyrna as well as the one in Murfreesboro. A lot of times on Saturday mornings, we stop by and their inventory changes weekly, so you never know what you're going to see. And it's mostly open box. The name fits it. It's exactly that. It's a yard sale. If you don't totally agree with the price, the staff is always friendly and nice and willing to work with you. That's the Yard Sale store in Smyrna at 111 Enon Springs Road West in Murfreesboro at 204 South Front Street and online at bestdealintown.com. All right, we're back. Wealth Magazine Show. I'm your host, Mike Sparks. I've got Genevieve Turner with Men of Valor doing awesome work, changing men's lives and, and saving the taxpayers millions of dollars. Genevieve, um, well, now, what, Genevieve, what is your background? You told me it was uh, an attorney. Yeah, don't tell anybody. But yeah, Bless your heart. Civil law. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you know, you, know Heather, you know Heather Michelle then, don't you? Yeah, we're good friends. Yeah, Heather, Heather and I are, are pretty close. I ruined her voting record. You know, she's she's really well, she's, she's really big Democrat, and it literally ruined her voting record because she said people brought it up. She's knocking on doors for me, but um, 
anyway, she's got a good heart uh, for 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 she people. Um, did I tell you um, my? Um, but I've got this bill. We were able to pass it this week. It, it hopefully it doesn't get held up in the Senate. It's helping folks get access to mental health care, uh, updating what they call the Hurt System, which is the the online portal uh, for the psychiatric beds. And it will show like if someone goes to the ER, it'll and then it's mental health. They'll say, okay, we've got a bed over here at Rolling Hills Trust Point or another facility. Uh, it passed unanimously. We worked on this for over a year, um, but. You know, the, the seriousness of this is, you know, I was telling the governor, I was trying to get the governor to take this bill up and the gun safe bill, which was mine last year. And he did take the gun safe bill, which we passed, which incentivized people to lock up firearms. You know, there's a rash of stolen firearms out there. But uh, Secretary of State and I, Trey Hargett, was at the ER or visiting the uh, Stonecrest Medical Center. And uh, the CEO, Luke Caputo, told us, he said, man, our ERs are overrun with mental health issues. He said, we need some relief. And the strange thing, uh, about a month later, I get asked to carry a bill by some mental health advocates, and that's that would offer relief. I call it a God wink uh, moment. Um, yeah, it's a God moment. It really is. I just say a prayer, you know, that, that it pass on the Senate side. Um, uh, but... I don't know. I just see so much craziness that's going on in this world. It's, you know, it's, it just seems like, you know, the young people, the future they have, it, sometimes it does look bleak. Um, the social media, I think, adds fuel to the fire. But um, what, what do you hear from men as far as your guys that, that you know, that, that do need hope? But what do you, what's the common theme with them that, that has turned their, their hearts and, and life around i think you've hit on jesus i mean i think that understanding the who the person of jesus is and wanting to conform your life to that that i mean how can that not transform you and i think yes. that another one is these guys we go i mean we give them big hugs when they get on campus we pick you up at the prison gate take you get a meal and hug on you as soon as you get in and a lot of them say, they're like, I haven't been hugged in years. They, they haven't. They've been living in a prison. They've been told when to eat, what to eat, what to wear, when to get up, who they can talk to, who to stay away from, yeah. where they're going to work. Um, and so their idea of normalcy and human dignity is completely off. Yeah. And the way I know that is because, um, you know, in prison, they're getting disciplinaries left and right. And at Men of Valor, we take anybody. It's not like we're only taking low-level crime. You know, yeah. these are vi- what would be considered violent offenders. And you know, we've never had a fight on our campus. Really? You know, these guys walk into are you our serious? straight out of prison. you never had a fight Hands there? on the counter. We've never had a fight. There's That's crazy. The counter, never, they've been getting disciplined. The way that they're treated... I mean, you are your surroundings. And so I think that if we Golly. look at other countries like Norway, Germany, other places that have this idea of, you know, they'll have a correctional officer sit down and you have to have an amount of touches with them. So play chess, you know, get to know them. And we're afraid of that in the U.S. Like they encourage people to not do that. To not, they, they are yeah. fearful that they'll be manipulated. Um, but it's just not the case. You, you know, know you sure, know. are we going to get games sometimes? Yeah. But. To, to give someone love and human dignity and that support, it clearly changes who they are. But you know the irony? I mean, think of, think about this. This is some deep psychological stuff going on here. Y'all have never had a fight. You know how many fights we've almost had in the Tennessee General Assembly? I've seen a lot of <laughs> fights go down, <laughs> seriously. Yeah. Seriously. Oh, and, no, um, it, it is, and, you know, and we're up there representing our lawmakers and I can't believe y'all haven't ever had a, a, a fight. Um, it's well, I hadn't really thought about it until a guy at the breakfast. He got up and said, "You know, I, I walked into my new apartment. I'm in a Valor campus, and there was knives on the counter." And, and I was like, "I know that was funny." Yeah, never was that the his that was that the Latino guy. Yeah, yeah that the, he's he's real short. And yeah, he's in prison, he's the guy that I only remember that he had. The, the Gideons brought the Bible. Yeah. And so he couldn't see out the window. He's too short. And he stacked them up and he said, I was standing on the word of the Lord. That is yeah. cool. What, but if you hear that guy's background, and that's what I was challenging my own members. I just said those with courage and conviction to go visit these juveniles, go visit a juvenile correctional center. And I had mentioned when I was at one here about a couple of months ago, 
I mean, the barbed wire fence, you know, it's 20, 30 feet high. And, and one kid, he, he didn't, you could, you could tell he didn't want to be there. The others, they were excited because they were getting cupcakes and Chick-fil-A and, you know, and all. And this one kid, I walked over to him and I mentioned the game of chess and that young man's eyes kind of lit up and he was about 17 and he said, I don't know how to play chess. Got excited. I said, you do? I said, what do you think about this theory, this hypothesis about learning the game of chess could help critical things? He, and he agreed. He thought it could. And and he asked me, he said, um, would, would you, will you pray with me? And that I was really like stunned. He wanted me to pray with him, and um, uh, and he asked me. And I felt I felt bad because I haven't I didn't get to go back and see him in time. He I'm assuming he was released because I didn't see him the last time I was there. He wasn't there, um, but I did bring up this week. Um, I, somebody had a piece of legislation about the um, the Veterans Court, and I got to give a shout out to Judge Ben Hall McFarland Jr and general tommy baker um he was there he's with veterans affairs and and i seen the general uh hug inmates i mean hug, well i shouldn't say inmate hug people that were graduating people that were pre previously incarcerated and it made me think of my late father my dad was world war ii spent 20 years 25 years in the military and uh i was told the meanest man in smyrna he was just hardcore military and just never got over it. But I never remember my dad ever like putting his arm around me. Hey, son, you know, I'm proud of you, something like that. He just, that just wasn't, well, that wasn't that generation. Right. But, you know, psychologically, there's something there. Yeah. You know, we're yeah. used to it with our moms. Yeah. Well, I get kidded about, about Tupac, because I quote Tupac a little bit in the chamber. Some people are kidding me about it. But if you listen to, to you, you know what I'm talking about, right? Tupac, don't you? I know Tupac. Okay, all right. But if you listen to his song, yeah. yeah, Dear Mama, he he says, you know, that I didn't cry for my, my dad's funeral because the man wasn't there. He said, I found love in a gang. And young guys are going to find, and women, love somewhere uh, but thankfully I had a stepfather that was a strong Christian man. Uh, so I kind of had, you know, a strong arm of military. Then my stepdad was a good, strong church of Christ, um, uh, guy, but, um, but now I appreciate what y'all y'all do. Now you ready for tomorrow? Cause y'all are coming up at two. We got a presentation honoring y'all. Uh, is everybody ready? We're ready. That's why I'm on campus now to talk to our men about it that are coming. They've just, we had a day on the hill uh, about a month ago, and a lot of the men didn't know what to think. Um, that's where we brought all of our guys who were in their first 30 days in the program. You're not allowed yeah. to work or anything in your first 30 days. We let you have a period of debriefing from prison. Yeah. Um, and so they came, and we set up meetings for them to go into y'all's offices, into legislators' offices. And my thought was, this is going to be great for these men. They can't vote, but they're going to feel like they still have a voice. This yep. is going to be a big deal. And what I've learned from it is that I think, I mean, as I sat in there and watched the legislators talk to them, I was like, How, this is what changes. This Amen. Yes. Other human beings that need more than a file and more than a case. And I was at dinner with one of my friends, he's a district attorney in Knoxville, a wonderful one. He said that finally someone invited her to a drug drug court graduation that she had put in prison. She's like, I never get invited to these things. I never see when they do well. No one ever tells me. So exactly. Yes. Well, thank you, Genevieve. We're out of time. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? All right. Thank you, Genevieve Turner Thanks with Men of, tomorrow, Men of Valor. Take care, folks. We'll talk at you next week for more of the Life Magazine show. <laughs>